a captivity of nearly three years among the savages of Nootka Sound. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Sue Anderson. A captivity of nearly three years among the savages of Nootka Sound by John R. Jewett. Section 1. I was born in Boston, a considerable borough town in Lincolnshire, in Great Britain, on the 21st of May, 1783. My father, Edward Jewett, was by trade a blacksmith, and esteemed among the first in his line of business in that place. At the age of three years, I had the misfortune to lose my mother, a most excellent woman, who died in childbed, leaving an infant daughter, who, with myself, and an elder brother by a former marriage of my father, constituted the whole of our family. My father, who considered a good education as the greatest blessing he could bestow on his children, was very particular in paying every attention to us in that respect, always exhorting us to behave well and endeavoring to impress on our minds the principles of virtue and morality, and no expense in his power was spared to have us instructed in what might render us useful and respectable in society. My brother, who was four years older than myself, and of a more hardy constitution, he destined for his own trade, but to me he had resolved to give an education superior to that which is to be obtained in a common school, it being his intention that I should adopt one of the learned professions. Accordingly, at the age of twelve, he took me from the school in which I had been taught the first rudiments of learning and placed me under the care of mr moses a celebrated teacher of an academy at donnington about eleven miles from boston in order to be instructed in the latin language and in some of the higher branches of the mathematics i there made considerable proficiency in writing reading and arithmetic and obtained a pretty good knowledge of navigation and of surveying but my progress in Latin was slow, not only owing to the little inclination I felt for learning that language, but to a natural impediment in my speech, which rendered it extremely difficult for me to pronounce it, so that in a short time, with my father's consent, I wholly relinquished the study. The period of my stay at this place was the most happy of my life. My preceptor, Mr. Moses, was not only a learned but a virtuous benevolent and amiable man universally beloved by his pupils who took delight in his instruction and to whom he allowed every proper amusement that consisted with attention to their studies one of the principal pleasures i enjoyed was in attending the fair which is regularly held twice a year at donnington in the spring and in the fall the second day being wholly devoted to selling horses, a prodigious number of which are brought thither for that purpose. As the scholars on these occasions were always indulged with a holiday, I cannot express with what eagerness of youthful expectation I used to anticipate these fairs, nor what delight I felt at the various shows, exhibitions of wild beasts, and other entertainments that they presented. I was frequently visited by my father, who always discovered much joy on seeing me, praised me for my acquirements, and usually left me a small sum for my pocket expenses. Among the scholars at this academy there was one named Charles Rice, with whom I formed a particular intimacy, which continued during the whole of my stay. He was my class and roommate, and, as the town he came from, ashby was more than sixty miles off instead of returning home he used frequently during the vacation to go with me to boston where he always met with a cordial welcome from my father 
who received me on these occasions with the greatest affection apparently taking much pride in me my friend in return used to take me with him to an uncle of his in donnington a very wealthy man who having no children of his own was very fond of his nephew and on his account i was always a welcome visitor at the house i had a good voice and an ear for music to which i was always passionately attached though my father endeavoured to discourage this propensity considering it as is too frequently the case but an introduction to a life of idleness and dissipation and having been remarked for my singing at church which was regularly attended on sundays and festival days by the scholars mr morthrop my friend rice's uncle used frequently to request me to sing he was always pleased with my exhibitions of this kind and it was no doubt one of the means that secured me so gracious a reception at his house a number of other gentlemen in the place would sometimes send for me to sing at their houses and as i was not a little vain of my vocal powers i was much gratified on receiving these invitations and accepted them with the greatest pleasure thus passed away the two happiest years of my life when my father thinking that i had received a sufficient education for the profession he intended me for took me from school at donnington in order to apprentice me to dr mason a surgeon of eminence at reesby in the neighbourhood of the celebrated sir joseph banks with regret did i part from my school acquaintance particularly my friend rice and returned home with my father on a short visit to my family preparatory to my intended apprenticeship the disinclination i ever had felt for the profession my father wished me to pursue was still further increased on my return when a child i was always fond of being in the shop among the workmen endeavouring to imitate what i saw them do this disposition so far increased after my leaving the academy that i could not bear to hear the least mention made of my being apprenticed to a surgeon and i used so many entreaties with my father to persuade him to give up this plan and learn me his own trade that he at last consented more fortunate would it probably have been for me had i gratified the wishes of this affectionate parent in adopting the profession he had chosen for me than thus to have induced him to sacrifice them to mine however it might have been i was at length introduced into the shop and my natural turn of mind corresponding with the employment i became in a short time uncommonly expert at the work to which i was set i now felt myself well contented pleased with my occupation and treated with much affection by my father and kindness by my stepmother my father having once more entered the state of matrimony with a widow much younger than himself who had been brought up in a superior manner and was an amiable and sensible woman about a year after i had commenced this apprenticeship my father finding that he could carry on his business to more advantage in hull removed thither with my family an event of no little importance to me as it in a great measure influenced my future destiny hull being one of the best ports in england and a place of great trade my father had there full employment for his numerous workmen particularly in vessel work this naturally led me to an acquaintance with the sailors on board some of the ships the many remarkable stories they told me of their voyages and adventures and of the manners and customs of the nations they had seen excited a strong wish in me to visit foreign countries which was increased by my reading the voyages of captain cook and some other celebrated navigators thus passed the four years that i lived at hull where my father was esteemed by all who knew him as a worthy industrious and thriving man 
at this period a circumstance occurred which afforded me the opportunity i had for some time wished of gratifying my inclination of going abroad among our principal customers at hull were the americans who frequented that port and from whose conversation my father as well as myself formed the most favorable opinion of that country as affording an excellent field for the exertions of industry and a flattering prospect for the establishment of a young man in life in the summer of the year eighteen o two during the peace between england and france the ship boston belonging to boston in massachusetts and commanded by captain john salter arrived at hull whither she came to take on board a cargo of such goods as were wanted for the trade with the indians on the northwest coast of america from whence after having taken in a lading of furs and skins she was to proceed to china and from thence home to america the ship having occasion for many repairs and alterations necessary for so long a voyage the captain applied to my father to do the smith's work which was very considerable that gentleman who was of a social turn used often to call at my father's house where he passed many of his evenings with his chief and second mates mr b de luisa and mr william ingraham the latter a fine young man of about twenty of a most amiable temper and of such affable manners as gained him the love and attachment of the whole crew these gentlemen used occasionally to take me with them to the theatre an amusement which i was very fond of and which my father rather encouraged than objected to as he thought it a good means of preventing young men who are naturally inclined to seek for something to amuse them from frequenting taverns alehouses and places of bad resort equally destructive of the health and morals while the stage frequently furnishes excellent lessons of morality and good conduct in the evenings that he passed at my father's captain salter who had for a great number of years been at sea and seen almost all parts of the world used sometimes to speak of his voyages and observing me listen with much attention to his relations he one day when i had brought him some work said to me in rather a jocose manner john how would you like to go with me i answered that it would give me great pleasure that i had for a long time wished to visit foreign countries particularly america which i had been told so many fine stories of and that if my father would give his consent and he was willing to take me with him i would go i shall be very glad to do it said he if your father can be prevailed on to let you go and as i want an expert smith for an armorer the one i have shipped for that purpose not being sufficiently master of his trade i have no doubt that you will answer my turn well as i perceive you are both active and ingenious and on my return to america i shall probably be able to do something much better for you in boston i will take the first opportunity of speaking to your father about it and try to persuade him to consent he accordingly the next evening that he called at our house introduced the subject my father at first would not listen to the proposal that best of parents though anxious for my advantageous establishment in life could not bear to think of parting with me but on captain salter's telling him of what benefit it would be to me to go the voyage with him and that it was a pity to keep a promising and ingenious young fellow like myself confined to a small shop in england when if i had tolerable success i might do so much better in america where wages were much higher and living cheaper he at length gave up his objections and consented that i should ship on board the boston as an armorer at the rate of thirty dollars per month with an agreement that the amount due to me together with a certain sum of money which my father gave captain salter for that purpose 
should be laid out by him on the northwest coast in the purchase of furs for my account to be disposed of in china for such goods as would yield a profit on the return of the ship my father being solicitous to give me every advantage in his power of well establishing myself in my trade in boston or some other maritime town of america such were the flattering expectations which this good man indulged respecting me alas the fatal disaster that befell us not only blasted all these hopes but involved me in extreme distress and wretchedness for a long period after End of section one section two of a captivity of nearly three years among the savages of nootka sound by john r jewett this librivox recording is in the public domain the ship having undergone a thorough repair and been well coppered proceeded to take on board her cargo which consisted of english cloths dutch blankets looking-glasses beads knives razors etc which were received from holland some sugar and molasses about twenty hogsheads of rum including stores for the ship a great quantity of ammunition cutlasses pistols and three thousand muskets and fowling pieces the ship being loaded and ready for sea as i was preparing for my departure my father came to me and taking me aside said to me with much emotion john i am now going to part with you and heaven only knows if we shall ever again meet but in whatever part of the world you are always bear it in mind that on your own conduct will depend your success in life be honest industrious frugal and temperate and you will not fail in whatsoever country it may be your lot to be placed to gain yourself friends let the bible be your guide and your reliance in any fortune that may befall you that almighty being who knows how to bring forth good from evil and who never deserts those who put their trust in him he repeated his exhortations to me to lead an honest and christian life and to recollect that i had a father a mother a brother and sister who could not but feel a strong interest in my welfare enjoining me to write him by the first opportunity that should offer to england from whatever part of the world i might be in more particularly on my arrival in boston this i promised to do but long unhappily was it before i was able to fulfil this promise i then took an affectionate leave of my worthy parent whose feelings would hardly permit him to speak and bidding an affectionate farewell to my brother sister and stepmother who expressed the greatest solicitude for my future fortune went on board the ship which proceeded to the downs to be ready for the first favorable wind i found myself well accommodated on board as regarded my work an iron forge having been erected on deck this my father had made for the ship on a new plan for which he afterwards obtained a patent while a corner of the steerage was appropriated to my vice bench so that in bad weather i could work below on the third day of september eighteen o two we sailed from the downs with a fair wind in company with twenty-four sail of american vessels most of which were bound home i was seasick for a few of the first days but it was of short continuance and on my recovery i found myself in uncommonly fine health and spirits and went to work with alacrity at my forge in putting in order some of the muskets and making daggers knives and small hatchets for the indian trade while in wet and stormy weather i was occupied below in filing and polishing them this was my employment having but little to do with sailing the vessel though i used occasionally to lend a hand in assisting the seamen in taking in and making sail as i had never before been out of sight of land 
i cannot describe my sensations after i had recovered from the distressing effects of seasickness on viewing the mighty ocean by which i was surrounded bounded only by the sky while its waves rising in mountains seemed every moment to threaten our ruin manifest as is the hand of providence in preserving its creatures from destruction in no instance is it more so than on the great deep for whether we consider in its tumultuary motions the watery deluge that each moment menaces to overwhelm us the immense violence of its shocks the little that interposes between us and death a single plank forming our only security which should it unfortunately be loosened would plunge us at once into the abyss our gratitude ought strongly to be excited towards that superintending deity who in so wonderful a manner sustains our lives amid the waves we had a pleasant and favourable passage of twenty-nine days to the island of st catherine on the coast of brazils where the captain had determined to stop for a few days to wood and water this place belongs to the portuguese on entering the harbour we were saluted by the fort which we returned the next day the governor of the island came on board of us with his suite captain salter received him with much respect and invited him to dine with him which he accepted the ship remained at st catherine's four days during which time we were busily employed in taking in wood water and fresh provisions captain salter thinking it best to furnish himself here with a full supply for his voyage to the northwest coast so as not to be obliged to stop at the sandwich islands st catherine is a very commodious place for vessels to stop at that are bound round cape horn as it abounds with springs of fine water with excellent oranges plantains and bananas having completed our stores we put to sea and on the twenty fifth of december at length passed cape horn which we had made no less than thirty-six days before but were repeatedly forced back by contrary winds experiencing very rough and tempestuous weather in doubling it immediately after passing cape horn all our dangers and difficulties seemed to be at an end the weather became fine and so little labor was necessary on board the ship that the men soon recovered from their fatigue and were in excellent spirits a few days after we fell in with an english south sea whaling ship homeward bound which was the only vessel we spoke with on our voyage we now took the trade wind or monsoon during which we enjoyed the finest weather possible so that for the space of a fortnight we were not obliged to reeve a topsail or to make a tack and so light was the duty and easy the life of the sailors during this time that they appeared the happiest of any people in the world captain salter who had been for many years in the east india trade was a most excellent seaman and preserved the strictest order and discipline on board his ship though he was a man of mild temper and conciliating manners and disposed to allow every indulgence to his men not inconsistent with their duty we had on board a fine band of music with which on saturday nights when the weather was pleasant we were accustomed to be regaled the captain ordering them to play for several hours for the amusement of the crew this to me was most delightful especially during the serene evenings we experienced in traversing the southern ocean as for myself during the day i was constantly occupied at my forge in refitting or repairing some of the ironwork of the vessel but principally in making tomahawks daggers etc for the northwest coast during the first part of our voyage we saw scarcely any fish excepting some whales a few sharks and flying fish but after weathering cape horn we met with numerous shoals of sea porpoises several of whom we caught and as we had been for some time without fresh provisions 
i found it not only a palatable but really a very excellent food to one who has never before seen them a shoal of these fish presents a very striking and singular appearance beheld at a distance coming towards a vessel they look not unlike a great number of small black waves rolling over one another in a confused manner and approaching with great swiftness as soon as a shoal is seen all is bustle and activity on board the ship the grains and the harpoons are immediately got ready and those who are best skilled in throwing them take their stand at the bow and along the gunwale anxiously awaiting the welcome troop as they come gambling and blowing around the vessel in search of food when pierced with the harpoon and drawn on board unless the fish is instantly killed by the stroke which rarely happens it utters most pitiful cries greatly resembling those of an infant the flesh cut into steaks and broiled is not unlike very coarse beef and the harslet in appearance and taste is so much like that of a hog that it would be no easy matter to distinguish the one from the other from this circumstance the sailors have given the name of herring hog to this fish i was told by some of the crew that if one of them happens to free itself from the grains or harpoons when struck all the others attracted by the blood immediately quit the ship and give chase to the wounded one and as soon as they overtake it immediately tear it in pieces we also caught a large shark which had followed the ship for several days with a hook which i made for the purpose and although the flesh was by no means equal to that of the herring hog yet to those destitute as we were of anything fresh i found it eat very well after passing the cape when the sea had become calm we saw great numbers of albatrosses a large brown and white bird of the goose kind one of which captain salter shot whose wings measured from their extremities fifteen feet one thing however i must not omit mentioning as it struck me in a most singular and extraordinary manner this was that on passing cape horn in december which was midsummer in that climate the nights were so light without any moon that we found no difficulty whatever in reading small print which we frequently did during our watches in this manner with a fair wind and easy weather from the twenty eighth of december the period of our passing cape horn we pursued our voyage to the northward until the twelfth of march eighteen o three when we made woody point in nootka sound on the northwest coast of america we immediately stood up the sound for nootka where captain salter had determined to stop in order to supply the ship with wood and water before proceeding up the coast to trade but in order to avoid the risk of any molestation or interruption to his men from the indians while thus employed he proceeded with the ship about five miles to the northward of the village which is situated on friendly cove and sent out his chief mate with several of the crew in the boat to find a good place for anchoring her after sounding for some time they returned with the information that they had discovered a secure place for anchorage on the western side of an inlet or small bay at about half a mile from the coast near a small island which protected it from the sea and where there was plenty of wood and excellent water the ship accordingly came to anchor in this place at twelve o'clock at night in twelve fathom water muddy bottom and so near the shore that to prevent the ship from winding we secured her by a hawser to the trees End of section two. Section 3 of A Captivity of Nearly Three Years Among the Savages of Nootka Sound by John R. Jewett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. On the morning of the next day, the 13th, 
several of the natives came on board in a canoe from the village of nootka with their king called maquina who appeared much pleased on seeing us and with great seeming cordiality welcomed captain salter and his officers to his country as i had never before beheld a savage of any nation it may readily be supposed that the novelty of their appearance so different from any people that i had hitherto seen excited in me strong feelings of surprise and curiosity i was however particularly struck with the looks of their king who was a man of dignified aspect about six feet in height and extremely straight and well proportioned his features were in general good and his face was rendered remarkable by a large roman nose a very uncommon form of feature among these people his complexion was of a dark copper hue though his face legs and arms were on this occasion so covered with red paint that their natural color could scarcely be perceived his eyebrows were painted black in two broad stripes like a new moon and his long black hair which shone with oil was fastened in a bunch on the top of his head and strewed or powdered all over with white down which gave him a most curious and extraordinary appearance he was dressed in a large mantle or cloak of the black sea otter skin which reached to his knees and was fastened around his middle by a broad belt of the cloth of the country wrought or painted with figures of several colors this dress was by no means unbecoming but on the contrary had an air of savage magnificence his men were habited in mantles of the same cloth which is made from the bark of a tree and has some resemblance to straw matting these are nearly square and have two holes in the upper part large enough to admit the arms they reach as low as the knees and are fastened around their bodies with a belt about four inches broad of the same cloth from his having frequently visited the english and american ships that traded to the coast maquina had learned the significance of a number of english words and in general could make himself pretty well understood by us in our own language he was always the first to go on board such ships as came to nootka which he was much pleased in visiting even when he had no trade to offer as he almost always received some small present and was in general extremely well treated by the commanders he remained on board of us for some time during which the captain took him into the cabin and treated him with a glass of rum these people being very fond of distilled spirits and some biscuit and molasses which they prefer to any kind of food that we can offer them as there are seldom many furs to be purchased at this place and it was not fully the season captain salter had put in here not so much with an expectation of trading as to procure an ample stock of wood and water for the supply of the ship on the coast thinking it more prudent to take it on board at nootka from the generally friendly disposition of the people than to endanger the safety of his men in sending them on shore for that purpose among the more ferocious natives of the north with this view we immediately set about getting our water casks in readiness and the next and two succeeding days part of the crew were sent on shore to cut pine timber and assist the carpenter in making it into yards and spars for the ship while those on board were employed in refitting the rigging repairing the sails etc when we proceeded to take in our wood and water as expeditiously as possible during which time i kept myself busily employed in repairing the muskets making knives tomaxes etc and doing such iron work as was wanted for the ship meantime more or less of the natives came on board of us daily bringing with them fresh salmon with which they supplied us in great plenty receiving in return some trifling articles captain salter was always very particular before admitting these people on board to see that they had no arms about them by obliging them indiscriminately 
to throw off their garments so that he felt perfectly secure from any attack on the fifteenth the king came on board with several of his chiefs he was dressed as before in his magnificent otter-skin robe having his face highly painted and his hair tossed off with a white down which looked like snow his chiefs were dressed in mantles of the country cloth of its natural color which is a pale yellow these were ornamented with a broad border painted or wrought in figures of several colors representing men's heads various animals etc and secured around them by a belt like that of the king from which it was distinguished only by being narrower the dress of the common people is of the same fashion and differs from that of the chiefs in being of a coarser texture and painted red of one uniform color captain salter invited maquina and his chiefs to dine with him and it was curious to see how these people when they eat seat themselves in their country fashion upon our chairs with their feet under them crossed like turks they cannot endure the taste of salt and the only thing they would eat with us was the ship bread which they were very fond of especially when dipped in molasses they had also a great liking for tea and coffee when well sweetened as iron weapons and tools of almost every kind are in much request among them whenever they came on board they were always very attentive to me crowding around me at the forge as if to see in what manner i did my work and in this way became quite familiar a circumstance as will be seen in the end of great importance to me the salmon which they brought us furnished a most delicious treat to men who for a long time had lived wholly on salt provisions excepting such few sea fish as we had had the good fortune occasionally to take we indeed feasted most luxuriously and flattered ourselves that we should not want while on the coast for plenty of fresh provisions little imagining the fate that awaited us and that this dainty food was to prove the unfortunate lure to our destruction on the nineteenth the king came again on board and was invited by the captain to dine with him he had much conversation with captain salter and informed him that there were plenty of wild ducks and geese near friendly cove on which the captain made him a present of a double-barreled fowling piece with which he appeared to be greatly pleased and soon after went on shore on the twentieth we were nearly ready for our departure having taken in what wood and water we were in want of the next day maquina came on board with nine pair of wild ducks as a present at the same time he brought with him the gun one of the locks of which he had broken telling the captain that it was peshak that is bad captain salter was very much offended at this observation and considering it a mark of contempt for his present he called the king a liar adding other opprobrious terms and taking the gun from him tossed it indignantly into the cabin and calling me to him said john this fellow has broken this beautiful fowling piece see if you can mend it on examining it i told him that it could be done as i have already observed maquina knew a number of english words and unfortunately understood but too well the meaning of the reproachful terms that the captain addressed to him he said not a word in reply but his countenance sufficiently expressed the rage he felt though he exerted himself to suppress it and i observed him while the captain was speaking repeatedly put his hand to his throat and rub it upon his bosom which he afterwards told me was to keep down his heart which was rising into his throat and choking him he soon after went on shore with his men evidently much discomposed on the morning of the twenty-second the natives came off to us as usual with salmon and remained on board when about noon maquina came alongside with a considerable number of his chiefs and men in their canoes 
who after going through the customary examination were admitted into the ship he had a whistle in his hand and over his face a very ugly mask of wood representing the head of some wild beast appeared to be remarkably good-humoured and gay and whilst his people sung and capered about the deck entertaining us with a variety of antic tricks and gestures he blew his whistle to a kind of tune which seemed to regulate their motions as captain salter was walking on the quarter-deck amusing himself with their dancing the king came up to him and inquired when he intended to go to sea he answered to-morrow maquina then said you love salmon much in friendly cove why not go then and catch some the captain thought it would be very desirable to have a good supply of these fish for the voyage and on consulting with mr de luisa it was agreed to send part of the crew on shore after dinner with the seine in order to procure a quantity maquina and his chief stayed and dined on board and after dinner the chief mate went off with nine men in the jolly boat and yawl to fish at friendly cove having set the steward on shore at our watering place to wash the captain's clothes shortly after the departure of the boats i went down to my vice bench in the steerage where i was employed in cleaning muskets i had not been there more than an hour when i heard the men hoisting in the longboat which in a few minutes after was succeeded by a great bustle and confusion on deck i immediately ran up the steerage stairs but scarcely was my head above deck when i was caught by the hair by one of the savages and lifted from my feet fortunately for me my hair being short and the ribbon with which it was tied slipping i fell from his hold into the steerage as i was falling he struck at me with an axe which cut a deep gash in my forehead and penetrated the skull but in consequence of his losing his hold i luckily escaped the full force of the blow which otherwise would have cleft my head in two i fell stunned and senseless upon the floor how long i continued in this situation i know not but on recovering my senses the first thing that i did was to try to get up but so weak was i from the loss of blood that i fainted and fell i was however soon recalled to my recollection by three loud shouts or yells from the savages which convinced me that they had got possession of the ship it is impossible for me to describe my feelings at this terrific sound some faint idea may be formed of them by those who have known what it is to half waken from a hideous dream and still think it real never no never shall i lose from my mind the impression of that dreadful moment i expected every instant to share the wretched fate of my unfortunate companions and when i heard the song of triumph by which these infernal yells was succeeded my blood ran cold in my veins having at length sufficiently recovered my senses to look around me after wiping the blood from my eyes i saw that the hatch of the steerage was shut this was done as i afterwards discovered by order of maquina who on seeing the savage strike at me with the axe told him not to hurt me for that i was the armourer and would be useful to them in repairing their arms while at the same time to prevent any of his men from injuring me he had the hatch closed but to me this circumstance wore a very different appearance for i thought that these barbarians had only prolonged my life in order to deprive me of it by the most cruel tortures i remained in this horrid state of suspense for a very long time when at length the hatch was opened and maquina calling me by name ordered me to come up i groped my way up as well as i was able being almost blinded with the blood that flowed from my wound and so weak as with difficulty to walk 
the king on perceiving my situation ordered one of his men to bring a pot of water to wash the blood from my face which having done i was able to see distinctly with one of my eyes but the other was so swollen from my wound that it was closed but what a terrific spectacle met my eyes six naked savages standing in a circle around me covered with the blood of my murdered comrades with their daggers uplifted in their hands prepared to strike i now thought my last moment had come and recommended my soul to my maker the king who as i have already observed knew enough of english to make himself understood entered the circle and placing himself before me addressed me nearly in the following words john i speak you no say no you say no daggers come he then asked me if i would be his slave during my life if i would fight for him in his battles if i would repair his muskets and make daggers and knives for him with several other questions to all of which i was careful to answer yes he then told me that he would spare my life and ordered me to kiss his hands and feet to show my submission to him which i did in the meantime his people were very clamorous to have me put to death so that there should be none of us left to tell our story to our countrymen and prevent them from coming to trade with them but the king in the most determined manner opposed their wishes and to his favor am i wholly indebted for my being yet among the living as i was busy at work at the time of the attack i was without my coat and what with the coldness of the weather my feebleness from the loss of blood the pain of my wound and the extreme agitation and terror that i still felt i shook like a leaf which the king observing went into the cabin and bringing up a great coat that belonged to the captain threw it over my shoulders telling me to drink some rum from a bottle which he handed me at the same time giving me to understand that it would be good for me and keep me from trembling as i did i took a draught of it after which taking me by the hand he led me to the quarter-deck where the most horrid sight presented itself that ever my eyes witnessed the heads of our unfortunate captain and his crew to the number of twenty-five were all arranged in a line and maquina ordering one of his people to bring a head asked me whose it was i answered the captain's in like manner the others were showed me and i told him the names excepting a few that were so horribly mangled that i was not able to recognize them end of section three section four of a captivity of nearly three years among the savages of nootka sound by john r jewett this librivox recording is in the public domain i now discovered that all our unfortunate crew had been massacred and learned that after getting possession of the ship the savages had broke open the arm chest and magazine and supplying themselves with ammunition and arms sent a party on shore to attack our men who had gone thither to fish and being joined by numbers from the village without difficulty overpowered and murdered them and cutting off their heads brought them on board after throwing their bodies into the sea on looking upon the deck i saw it entirely covered with the blood of my poor comrades whose throats had been cut with their own jackknives the savages having seized the opportunity while they were busy and hoisting in the boat to grapple with them and overpower them by their numbers in the scuffle the captain was thrown overboard and dispatched by those in the canoes who immediately cut off his head what i felt on this occasion may be more readily conceived than expressed 
after i had answered his questions maquina took my silk handkerchief from my neck and bound it around my head placing over the wound a leaf of tobacco of which we had a quantity on board this was done at my desire as i had often found from personal experience the benefit of this application to cuts maquina then ordered me to get the ship under way for friendly cove this i did by cutting the cables and sending some of the natives aloft to loose the sails which they performed in a very bungling manner but they succeeded so far in loosing the jib and topsails that with the advantage of a fair wind i succeeded in getting the ship into the cove where by order of the king i ran her ashore on a sandy beach at eight o'clock at night we were received by the inhabitants of the village men women and children with loud shouts of joy and a most horrible drumming with sticks upon the roofs and sides of their houses in which they had also stuck a great number of lighted pine torches to welcome their king's return and congratulate him on the success of his enterprise maquina then took me on shore to his house which was very large and filled with people where i was received with much kindness by the women particularly those belonging to the king who had no less than nine wives all of whom came around me expressing much sympathy for my misfortune gently stroking and patting my head in an encouraging and soothing manner with words expressive of condolence how sweet is compassion even from savages those who have been in a similar situation can alone truly appreciate its value in the meantime all the warriors of the tribe to the number of five hundred had assembled at the king's house to rejoice for their success they exulted greatly in having taken our ship and each one boasted of his own particular exploits in killing our men but they were in general much dissatisfied with my having been suffered to live and were very urgent with maquina to deliver me to them to be put to death which he obstinately refused to do telling them that he had promised me my life and would not break his word and that besides i knew how to repair and to make arms and should be of great use to them the king then seated me by him and ordered his women to bring him something to eat when they set before him some dried clams and train oil of which he ate very heartily and encouraged me to follow his example telling me to eat much and take a great deal of oil which would make me strong and fat notwithstanding his praise of this new kind of food i felt no disposition to indulge in it both the smell and taste being loathsome to me and had it been otherwise such was the pain i endured the agitation of my mind and the gloominess of my reflections that i should have felt very little inclination for eating not satisfied with his first refusal to deliver me up to them the people again became clamorous that maquina should consent to my being killed saying that not one of us ought to be left alive to give information to others of our countrymen and prevent them from coming to trade or induce them to revenge the destruction of our ship and they at length became so boisterous that he caught up a large club in a passion and drove them all out of the house during this scene a son of the king of about eleven years old attracted no doubt by the singularity of my appearance came up to me i caressed him he returned my attentions with much apparent pleasure and considering this a fortunate opportunity to gain the goodwill of the father i took the child on my knee and cutting the metal buttons from off the coat i had on i tied them around his neck at this he was highly delighted and became so much attached to me that he would not quit me 
the king appeared much pleased with my attention to his son and telling me that it was time to go to sleep directed me to lie with his son next to him as he was afraid lest some of his people would come while he was asleep and kill me with their daggers i lay down as he ordered me but neither the state of my mind nor the pain i felt would allow me to sleep about midnight i was greatly alarmed by the approach of one of the natives who came to give information to the king that there was one of the white men alive who had knocked him down as he went on board the ship at night this maquina communicated to me giving me to understand that as soon as the sun rose he should kill him i endeavored to persuade him to spare his life but he bade me be silent and go to sleep i said nothing more but lay revolving in my mind what method i could devise to save the life of this man what a consolation thought i what a happiness would it prove to me in my forlorn state among these heathen to have a christian and one of my own countrymen for a companion and how greatly would it alleviate and lighten the burden of my slavery as i was thinking of some plan for his preservation it all at once came into my mind that this man was probably the sailmaker of the ship named thompson as i had not seen his head among those on deck and knew that he was below at work upon the sails not long before the attack the more i thought of it the more probable it appeared to me and as thompson was a man nearly forty years of age and had an old look i conceived it would be easy to make him pass for my father and by this means prevail on maquina to spare his life towards morning i fell into a doze but was awakened with the first beams of the sun by the king who told me that he was going to kill the man who was on board the ship and ordered me to accompany him i rose and followed him leading with me the young prince his son on coming to the beach i found all the men of the tribe assembled the king addressed them saying that one of the white men had been found alive on board the ship and requested their opinion as to saving his life or putting him to death they were unanimously for the first this determination he made known to me having arranged my plan i asked him pointing to the boy whom i still held by the hand if he loved his son he answered that he did i then asked the child if he loved his father and on his replying in the affirmative i said and i also love mine i then threw myself on my knees at maquina's feet and implored him with tears in my eyes to spare my father's life if the man on board should prove to be him telling him that if he killed my father it was my wish that he should kill me too and that if he did not i would kill myself and that he would thus lose my services whereas by sparing my father's life he would preserve mine which would be of great advantage to him by my repairing and making arms for him maquina appeared moved by my entreaties and promised not to put the man to death if he should be my father he then explained to his people what i had said and ordered me to go on board and tell the man to come on shore to my unspeakable joy on going into the hold i found that my conjecture was true thompson was there he had escaped without any injury excepting a slight wound in the nose given him by one of the savages with a knife as he attempted to come on deck during the scuffle finding the savages in possession of the ship as he afterwards informed me he secreted himself in the hold hoping for some chance to make his escape but that the indian who came on board in the night 
approaching the place where he was he supposed himself discovered and being determined to sell his life as dearly as possible as soon as he came within his reach he knocked him down but the indian immediately springing up ran off at full speed i informed him in a few words that all our men had been killed that the king had preserved my life and had consented to spare his on the supposition that he was my father an opinion which he must be careful not to undeceive them in as it was his only safety after giving him his cue i went on shore with him and presented him to maquina who immediately knew him to be the sailmaker and was much pleased observing that he could make sails for his canoe he then took us to his house and ordered something for us to eat on the twenty fourth and twenty fifth the natives were busily employed in taking the cargo out of the ship stripping her of her sails and rigging cutting away the spars and masts and in short rendering her as complete a wreck as possible the muskets ammunition cloth and all the principal articles taken from her being deposited in the king's house while they were thus occupied each one taking what he liked my companion and myself being obliged to aid them i thought it best to secure the accounts and papers of the ship in hopes that on some future day i might have it in my power to restore them to the owners with this view i took possession of the captain's writing desk which contained the most of them together with some paper and implements for writing i had also the good fortune to find a blank account book in which i resolved should it be permitted me to write an account of our capture and the most remarkable occurrences that i should meet with during my stay among these people fondly indulging the hope that it would not be long before some vessel would arrive to release us i likewise found in the cabin a small volume of sermons a bible and a common prayer book of the church of england which furnished me and my comrade great consolation in the midst of our mournful servitude and enabled me under the favor of divine providence to support with firmness the miseries of a life which i might otherwise have found beyond my strength to endure as these people set no value upon things of this kind i found no difficulty in appropriating them to myself by putting them in my chest which though it had been broken open and rifled by the savages as i still had the key i without much difficulty secured in this i also put some small tools belonging to the ship with several other articles particularly a journal kept by the second mate mr ingraham and a collection of drawings and views of places taken by him which i had the good fortune to preserve and on my arrival at boston i gave them to a connection of his the hon judge dawes who sent them to his family in new york on the twenty sixth two ships were seen standing in for friendly cove at their first appearance the inhabitants were thrown into great confusion but soon collecting a number of muskets and blunderbusses ran to the shore from whence they kept up so brisk a fire at them that they were evidently afraid to approach nearer and after firing a few rounds of grape-shot which did no harm to any one they wore ship and stood out to sea these ships as i afterwards learned were the mary and juno of boston they were scarcely out of sight when maquina expressed much regret that he had permitted his people to fire at them being apprehensive that they would give information to others in what manner they had been received and prevent them from coming to trade with him a few days after hearing of the capture of the ship there arrived at nootka a great number of canoes filled with savages from no less than twenty tribes to the north and south among those from the north were the aititsarts shumadits newitais 
Savinars, Aoarts, Mowachits, Sussets, Nuchadlits, Mishiaits, and Cayucets, the most of whom were considered as tributary to Nutka. From the south, the Aicht Arts and Esquites, also tributary, with the Klauquats and the Wiccaninish, a large and powerful tribe about two hundred miles distant. These last were better clad than most of the others, and their canoes wrought with much greater skill. They are furnished with sails as well as paddles, and with the advantages of a fair breeze, are usually but twenty-four hours on their passage. Makina, who was very proud of his new acquisition, was desirous of welcoming these visitors in the European manner. He accordingly ordered his men, as the canoes approached, to assemble on the beach with loaded muskets and blunderbusses, placing Thompson at the cannon which had been brought from the ship and laid upon two long sticks of timber in front of the village. Then, taking a speaking trumpet in his hand, he ascended with me the roof of his house and began drumming or beating upon the boards with a stick most violently. Nothing could have been more ludicrous than the appearance of this motley group of savages collected on the shore, dressed as they were with their ill-gotten finery, in the most fantastic manner, some in women's smocks taken from our cargo, others in cutsacks or cloaks of blue, red, or yellow broadcloth, with stockings drawn over their heads and their necks hung round with numbers of powder horns shot bags and cartouche boxes some of them having no less than ten muskets apiece on their shoulders and five or six daggers in their girdles diverting indeed was it to see them all squatted upon the beach holding their muskets perpendicularly with the butt pressed into the sand instead of against their shoulders and in this position awaited the order to fire Makina, at last called to them with his trumpet to fire which they did in the most awkward and timid manner with their muskets hard pressed upon the ground as above mentioned at the same moment the cannon were fired by thompson immediately on which they threw themselves back and began to roll and tumble over the sand as if they had been shot when suddenly springing up they began a song of triumph and running backward and forward upon the shore with the wildest gesticulations boasted of their exploits and exhibited as trophies what they had taken from us notwithstanding the unpleasantness of my situation and the feelings that this display of our spoils excited i could not avoid laughing at the strange appearance of these savages their awkward movements and the singular contrast of their dress and arms. End of section four. Section five of a captivity of nearly three years among the savages of Nootka Sound by John R. Jewett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. When the ceremony was concluded, Makina invited the strangers to a feast at his house, consisting of whale blubber, smoked herring spawn, and dried fish and train oil, of which they eat most plentifully. The feast being over, the trays out of which they eat and other things were immediately removed to make room for the dance which was to close the entertainment. This was performed by Makina's son, the young prince Satsatsoksis, whom I have already spoken of in the following manner. Three of the principal chiefs, dressed in their otter-skin mantles, which they wear only on extraordinary occasions and at festivals, having their heads covered over with white down, and their faces highly painted, came forward into the middle of the room, each furnished with a bag filled with the white down, which they scattered around in such a manner as to represent a fall of snow. These were followed by the young prince, who was dressed in a long piece of yellow cloth wrapped loosely around him, 
and decorated with small bells with a cap on his head to which was fastened a curious mask in imitation of a wolf's head while the rear was brought up by the king himself in his robe of sea otter skin with a small whistle in his mouth and a rattle in his hand with which he kept time to a sort of tune on his whistle after passing very rapidly in this order around the house each of them seated himself except the prince who immediately began his dance which principally consisted in springing up into the air in a squat posture and constantly turning around on his heels with great swiftness in a very narrow circle this dance with a few intervals of rest was continued for about two hours during which the chiefs kept up a constant drumming with sticks of about a foot in length on a long hollow plank which was though a very noisy a most doleful kind of music this they accompanied with songs the king himself acting as chorister while the women applauded each feat of activity in the dancer by repeating the words wakash wakash tai that is good very good prince as soon as the dance was finished maquina began to give presents to the strangers in the name of his son satsatsoxis these were pieces of european cloth generally of a fathom in length muskets powder shot etc whenever he gave them anything they had a peculiar manner of snatching it from him with a very stern and surly look repeating each time the words wakash tai this i understood to be their custom and was considered as a compliment which if omitted would be supposed as a mark of disregard for the present on this occasion maquina gave away no less than one hundred muskets the same number of looking-glasses four hundred yards of cloth and twenty casks of powder besides other things after receiving these presents the strangers retired on board their canoes for so numerous were they that maquina would not suffer any but the chiefs to sleep in the houses and in order to prevent the property from being pillaged by them he ordered thompson and myself to keep guard during the night armed with cutlasses and pistols in this manner tribes of savages from various parts of the coast continued coming for several days bringing with them blubber oil herring spawn dried fish and clams for which they received in return presents of cloth etc after which they in general immediately returned home i observed that very few if any of them except the chiefs had arms which i afterwards learned is the custom with these people whenever they come upon a friendly visit or to trade in order to show on their approach that their intentions are pacific early on the morning of the nineteenth the ship was discovered to be on fire this was owing to one of the savages having gone on board with a firebrand at night for the purpose of plunder some sparks from which fell into the hold and communicating with some combustibles soon enveloped the whole in flames the natives regretted the loss of the ship the more as a great part of her cargo still remained on board to my companion and myself it was a most melancholy sight for with her disappeared from our eyes every trace of a civilized country but the disappointment we experienced was still more severely felt for we had calculated on having the provision to ourselves which would have furnished us with a stock for years as whatever is cured with salt together with most of our other articles of food are never eaten by these people i had luckily saved all my tools excepting the anvil and the bellows which was attached to the forge and from their weight had not been brought on shore we had also the good fortune in looking over what had been taken from the ship to discover a box of chocolate and a case of port wine which as the indians were not fond of it proved a great comfort to us for some time and from one of the natives i obtained a nautical almanac 
which had belonged to the captain and which was of great use to me in determining the time about two days after on examining their booty the savages found a tierce of rum with which they were highly delighted as they have become very fond of spirituous liquors since their intercourse with the whites this was towards evening and maquina having assembled all the men at his house gave a feast at which they drank so freely of the rum that in a short time they became so extremely wild and frantic that thompson and myself apprehensive for our safety thought it prudent to retire privately into the woods where we continued till past midnight on our return we found the women gone who are always very temperate drinking nothing but water having quitted the house and gone to the other huts to sleep so terrified were they at the conduct of the men who lay all stretched out on the floor in a state of complete intoxication how easy in this situation would it have been for us to have dispatched or made ourselves masters of our enemies had there been any ship near to which we could have escaped but as we were situated the attempt would have been madness the wish of revenge was however less strongly impressed on my mind than what appeared to be so evident an interposition of divine providence in our favor how little can man penetrate its designs and how frequently is that intended as a blessing which he views as a curse the burning of our ship which we had lamented so much as depriving us of so many comforts now appeared to us in a very different light for had the savages got possession of the rum of which there were nearly twenty puncheons on board we must inevitably have fallen a sacrifice to their fury in some of their moments of intoxication this cask fortunately and a case of gin was all the spirits they obtained from the ship to prevent the reoccurrence of similar danger i examined the cask and finding still a considerable quantity remaining i bored a small hole in the bottom with a gimblet which before morning to my great joy completely emptied it by this time the wound in my head began to be much better so that i could enjoy some sleep which i had been almost deprived of by the pain and though i was still feeble from the loss of blood and my sufferings i found myself sufficiently well to go to work at my trade in making for the king and his wives bracelets and other small ornaments of copper or steel and in repairing the arms making use of a large square stone for the anvil and heating my metal in a common wood fire this was very gratifying to maquina and his women particularly and secured me their good will in the meantime great numbers from the other tribes kept continually flocking to nootka bringing with them in exchange for the ship's plunder such quantities of provision that notwithstanding the little success that maquina met with in whaling this season and their gluttonous waste always eating to excess when they have it regardless of the morrow seldom did the natives experience any want of food during the summer as to myself and companion we fared as they did never wanting for such provision as they had though we were obliged to eat it cooked in their manner and with train oil as a sauce a circumstance not a little unpleasant both from their uncleanly mode of cooking and many of the articles of their food which to a european are very disgusting but as the saying is hunger will break through stone walls and we found at times in the blubber of sea animals and the flesh of the dogfish loathsome as it in general was a very acceptable repast but much oftener would poor thompson who was no favorite with them have suffered from hunger had it not been for my furnishing him with provision this i was enabled to do from my work maquina allowing me the privilege when not employed for him to work for myself in making bracelets and other ornaments of copper fish-hooks 
daggers etc either to sell to the tribes who visited us or for our own chiefs who on these occasions besides supplying me with as much as i wished to eat and a sufficiency for thompson almost always made me a present of an european garment taken from the ship or some fathoms of cloth which were made up by my comrade and enabled us to go comfortably clad for some time or small bundles of pen-knives razors scissors etc for one of which we could almost always procure from the natives two or three fresh salmon cod or halibut or dried fish clams and herring spawn from the stranger tribes and had we only been permitted to cook them after our own way as we had pots and other utensils belonging to the ship we should not have had much cause of complaint in this respect but so tenacious are these people of their customs particularly in the article of food and cooking that the king always obliged me to give whatever provisions i bought to the women to cook and one day finding thompson and myself on the shore employed in boiling down sea-water into salt on being told what it was he was very much displeased and taking the little we had procured threw it into the sea in one instance alone as a particular favor he allowed me to boil some salmon in my own way when i invited him and his queen to eat with me they tasted it but did not like it and made their meal of some of it that i had cooked in their country fashion in may the weather became uncommonly mild and pleasant and so forward was vegetation that i picked plenty of strawberries by the middle of the month of this fruit there are great quantities on this coast and i found them a most delicious treat my health now had become almost re-established my wound being so far healed that it gave me no further trouble i had never failed to wash it regularly once a day in sea water and to dress it with a fresh leaf of tobacco which i obtained from the natives who had taken it from the ship but made no use of it this was all the dressing i gave it except applying to it two or three times a little loaf sugar which maquina gave me in order to remove some proud flesh which prevented it from closing my cure would doubtless have been much sooner effected had i been in a civilized country where i could have had it dressed by a surgeon and properly attended to but alas i had no good samaritan with oil and wine to bind up my wounds and fortunate might i even esteem myself that i was permitted to dress it myself for the utmost that i could expect from the natives was compassion for my misfortune which i indeed experienced from the women particularly the queen or favorite wife of maquina the mother of satsatsoxis who used frequently to point to my head and manifest much kindness and solicitude for me i must do maquina the justice to acknowledge that he always appeared desirous of sparing me any labor which he believed might be hurtful to me frequently inquiring in an affectionate manner if my head pained me as for the others some of the chiefs excepted they cared little what became of me and probably would have been gratified with my death my health being at length re-established and my wound healed thompson became very importunate for me to begin my journal and as i had no ink proposed to cut his finger to supply me with blood for the purpose whenever i should want it on the first of june i accordingly commenced a regular diary but had no occasion to make use of the expedient suggested by my comrade having found a much better substitute in the expressed juice of a certain plant which furnished me with a bright green color and after making a number of trials i at length succeeded in obtaining a very tolerable ink by boiling the juice of the blackberry with a mixture of finely powdered charcoal and filtering it through a cloth this i afterwards preserved in bottles and found it answer very well so true is it that necessity is the mother of invention as for quills i found no difficulty in procuring them whenever i wanted 
from the crows and ravens with which the beach was almost always covered attracted by the offal of whales seals etc and which were so tame that i could easily kill them with stones while a large clamshell furnished me with an inkstand the extreme solicitude of thompson that i should begin my journal might be considered as singular in a man who neither knew how to write or read a circumstance by the way very uncommon in an american were we less acquainted with the force of habit he having been for many years at sea and accustomed to consider the keeping of a journal as a thing indispensable this man was born in philadelphia and at eight years old ran away from his friends and entered as a cabin boy on board a ship bound to london on his arrival there finding himself in distress he engaged as an apprentice to the captain of a collier from whence he was impressed on board an english man of war and continued in the british naval service about twenty-seven years during which he was present at the engagement under lord howe with the french fleet in june seventeen ninety four and when peace was made between england and france was discharged he was a very strong and powerful man an expert boxer and perfectly fearless indeed so little was his dread of danger that when irritated he was wholly regardless of his life of this the following will furnish a sufficient proof one evening about the middle of april as i was at the house of one of the chiefs where i had been employed on some work for him word was brought me that maquina was going to kill thompson i immediately hurried home where i found the king in the act of presenting a loaded musket at thompson who was standing before him with his breast barred and calling on him to fire i instantly stepped up to maquina who was foaming with rage and addressing him in soothing words begged him for my sake not to kill my father and at length succeeded in taking the musket from him and persuading him to sit down on inquiring into the cause of his anger i learned that while thompson was lighting the lamps in the king's room maquina having substituted ours for their pine torches some of the boys began to tease him running around him and pulling him by the trousers among the most forward of whom was the young prince this caused thompson to spill the oil which threw him into such a passion that without caring what he did he struck the prince so violent a blow in his face with his fist as to knock him down the sensation excited among the savages by an act which was considered as the highest indignity and a profanation of the sacred person of majesty may be easily conceived the king was immediately acquainted with it who on coming in and seeing his son's face covered with blood seized a musket and began to load it determined to take instant revenge on the audacious offender and had i arrived a few minutes later than i did my companion would certainly have paid with his life for his rash and violent conduct i found the utmost difficulty in pacifying maquina who for a long time after could not forgive thompson but would repeatedly say john you die thompson kill but to appease the king was not all that was necessary in consequence of the insult offered to their prince the whole tribe held a council in which it was unanimously resolved that thompson should be put to death in the most cruel manner i however interceded so strenuously with maquina for his life telling him that if my father was killed i was determined not to survive him that he refused to deliver him up to the vengeance of his people saying that for john's sake they must consent to let him live the prince who after i had succeeded in calming his father gave me an account of what had happened told me that it was wholly out of regard to me as thompson was my father that his life had been spared for that if any one of the tribe should dare to lift a hand against him in anger he would most certainly be put to death end of section five
Section 6 of a Captivity of Nearly Three Years Among the Savages of Nootka Sound by John R. Jewett. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Yet even this narrow escape produced not much effect on Thompson, or induced him to restrain the violence of his temper, for not many weeks after he was guilty of a similar indiscretion in striking the eldest son of a chief who was about eighteen years old and according to their custom was considered as a tai or chief himself in consequence of his having provoked him by calling him a white slave this affair caused great commotion in the village and the tribe was very clamorous for his death but maquina would not consent i used frequently to remonstrate with him on the improvidence of his conduct and beg him to govern his temper better telling him that it was our duty since our lives were in the power of these savages to do nothing to exasperate them but all i could say on this point availed little for so bitter was the hate he felt for them which he was no way backward in manifesting both by his looks and actions that he declared he never would submit to their insults and that he had much rather be killed than be obliged to live among them adding that he only wished he had a good vessel and some guns and he would destroy the whole of the cursed race for to a brave sailor like him who had fought the french and spaniards with glory it was a punishment worse than death to be a slave to such a poor ignorant despicable set of beings as for myself i thought very differently after returning thanks to the merciful being who had in so wonderful a manner softened the hearts of the savages in my favor i had determined from the first of my capture to adopt a conciliating conduct towards them and conform myself as far as was in my power to their customs and mode of thinking trusting that the same divine goodness that had rescued me from death would not always suffer me to languish in captivity among these heathens with this view i sought to gain their good will by always endeavouring to assume a cheerful countenance appearing pleased with their sports and buffoon tricks making little ornaments for the wives and children of their chiefs by which means i became quite a favourite with them and fish-hooks daggers etc for themselves as a further recommendation to their favour and what might eventually prove of the utmost importance to us i resolved to learn their language which in the course of a few months residence i so far succeeded in acquiring as to be able in general to make myself well understood i likewise tried to persuade thompson to learn it as what might prove necessary to him but he refused saying that he hated both them and their cursed lingo and would have nothing to do with it by pursuing this conciliatory plan so far did i gain the good will of these savages particularly the chiefs that i scarcely ever failed experiencing kind treatment from them and was received with a smile of welcome at their houses where i was always sure of having something given to me to eat whenever they had it and many a good meal have i had from them when they themselves were short of provisions and suffering for the want of them and it was a common practice with me when we had nothing to eat at home which happened not unfrequently during my stay among them to go around the village and on noticing a smoke from any of the houses which denoted that they were cooking enter in without ceremony and ask them for something which i was never refused few nations indeed are there so very rude and unfeeling whom constant mild treatment and attention to please will not mollify and obtain from some return of kind attention this the treatment i received from these people may exemplify for not numerous 
even among those calling themselves civilized are there instances to be found of persons depriving themselves of food to give it to a stranger whatever may be his merits it may perhaps be as well in this place to give a description of nootka some accounts of the tribes who were accustomed to visit us and the manners and customs of the people as far as i hitherto had an opportunity of observing them the village of nootka is situated in between forty nine and fifty degrees north latitude at the bottom of friendly cove on the west or northwest side it consists of about twenty houses or huts on a small hill which rises with a gentle ascent from the shore friendly cove which affords good and secure anchorage for ships close in within the shore is a small harbor of not more than a quarter or half a mile in length and about half a mile or three-quarters broad formed by the line of coast on the east and a long point or headland which extends as much as three leagues into the sound in nearly a westerly direction this as well as i can judge from what i have seen of it is in general from one to two miles in breadth and mostly a rocky and unproductive soil with but few trees the eastern and western shores of this harbor are steep and in many parts rocky the trees growing quite to the water's edge but the bottom to the north and northwest is a fine sandy beach of half a mile or more in extent from the village to the north and northeast extends a plain the soil of which is very excellent and with proper cultivation may be made to produce almost any of our european vegetables this is but little more than half a mile in breadth and is terminated by the sea coast which in this place is lined with rocks and reefs and cannot be approached by ships the coast in the neighborhood of nootka is in general low and but little broken into hills and valleys the soil is good well covered with fine forests of pine spruce beech and other trees and abounds with streams of the finest water the general appearance being the same for many miles around the village is situated on the ground occupied by the spaniards when they kept a garrison here the foundations of the church and the governor's house are yet visible and a few european plants are still to be found which continue to be self-propagated such as onions peas and turnips but the two last are quite small particularly the turnips which afforded us nothing but the tops for eating their former village stood on the same spot but the spaniards finding it a commodious situation demolished the houses and forced the inhabitants to retire five or six miles into the country with great sorrow as maquina told me did they find themselves compelled to quit their ancient place of residence but with equal joy did they repossess themselves of it when the spanish garrison was expelled by the english the houses as i have observed are above twenty in number built nearly in a line these are of different sizes according to the rank or quality of the tai or chief who lives in them each having one of which he is considered as the lord they vary not much in width being usually from thirty-six to forty feet wide but are of very different lengths that of the king which is much the longest being about one hundred and fifty feet while the smallest which contain only two families do not exceed forty feet in length the house of the king is also distinguished from the others by being higher their method of building is as follows they erect in the ground two very large posts at such a distance apart as is intended for the length of the house on these which are of equal height and hollowed out at the upper end they lay a large spar for the ridgepole of the building or if the length of the house requires it two or more 
supporting their ends by similar upright posts these spars are sometimes of an almost incredible size having myself measured one in maquina's house which i found to be one hundred feet long and eight feet four inches in circumference at equal distances from these two posts two others are placed on each side to form the width of the building these are rather shorter than the first and on them are laid in like manner spars but of a smaller size having the upper part hewed flat with a narrow ridge on the outer side to support the ends of the planks the roof is formed of pine planks with a broad feather edge so as to lap well over each other which are laid lengthwise from the ridge pole in the centre to the beams at the sides after which the top is covered with planks of eight feet broad which form a kind of coving projecting so far over the ends of the planks that form the roof as completely to exclude the rain on these they lay large stones to prevent their being displaced by the wind the ends of the planks are not secured to the beams on which they are laid by any fastening so that in a high storm i have often known all the men obliged to turn out and go upon the roof to prevent them from being blown off carrying large stones and pieces of rock with them to secure the boards always stripping themselves naked on these occasions whatever may be the severity of the weather to prevent their garments from being wet and muddied as these storms are almost always accompanied with heavy rains the sides of their houses are much more open and exposed to the weather this proceeds from their not being so easily made close to the roof being built with planks of about ten feet long and four or five feet wide which they place between stanchions or small posts of the height of the roof of these there are four to each range of boards two at each end and so near each other as to leave space enough for admitting a plank the planks or boards which they make use of for building their houses and for other uses they procure of different lengths as occasion requires by splitting them out with hard wooden wedges from pine logs and afterwards dubbing them down with their chisels with much patience to the thickness wanted rendering them quite smooth there is but one entrance this is placed usually at the end though sometimes in the middle as was that of maquinas through the middle of the building from one end to the other runs a passage of about eight or nine feet broad on each side of which the several families that occupy it live each having its particular fireplace but without any kind of wall or separation to mark their respective limits the chief having his apartment at the upper end and the next in rank opposite on the other side they have no other floor than the ground the fireplace or hearth consists of a number of stones loosely put together but they are wholly without a chimney nor is there any opening left in the roof but whenever a fire is made the plank immediately over it is thrust aside by means of a pole to give vent to the smoke the height of the houses in general from the ground to the centre of the roof does not exceed ten feet that of maquinas was not far from fourteen the spar forming the ridge pole of the latter was painted in red and black circles alternately by way of ornament and the large posts that supported it had their tops curiously wrought or carved so as to represent human heads of a monstrous size which were painted in their manner these were not however considered as objects of adoration but merely as ornaments the furniture of these people is very simple and consists only of boxes in which they put their clothes furs and such things as they hold most valuable tubs for keeping their provisions of spawn and blubber in trays from which they eat baskets for their dried fish and other purposes 
and bags made of bark matting of which they also make their beds spreading a piece of it upon the ground when they lie down and using no other bed covering than their garments the boxes are of pine with a top that shuts over and instead of nails or pegs are fastened with flexible twigs they are extremely smooth and highly polished and sometimes ornamented with rows of very small white shells the tubs are of a square form secured in the like manner and of various sizes some being extremely large having seen them that were six feet long by four broad and five deep the trays are hollowed out with their chisels from a solid block of wood and the baskets and mats are made from the bark of trees from bark they likewise make the cloth for their garments in the following manner a quantity of this bark is taken and put into fresh water where it is kept for a fortnight to give it time to completely soften it is then taken out and beaten upon a plank with an instrument made of bone or some very hard wood having grooves or hollows on one side of it care being taken to keep the mass constantly moistened with water in order to separate with more ease the hard and woody from the soft and fibrous parts which when completed they parcel out into skeins like thread these they lay in the air to bleach and afterwards dye them black or red as suits their fancies their natural color being a pale yellow in order to form the cloth the women by whom the whole of this process is performed take a certain number of these skeins and twist them together by rolling them with their hands upon their knees into hard rolls which are afterwards connected by means of a strong thread made for the purpose their dress usually consists of but a single garment which is a loose cloak or mantle called cutsack in one piece reaching nearly to the feet this is tied loosely over the right or left shoulder so as to leave the arms at full liberty those of the common people are painted red with ochre the better to keep out the rain but the chiefs wear them of their native color which is a pale yellow ornamenting them with borders of the sea otter skin a kind of gray cloth made of the hair of some animal which they procure from the tribes to the south or their own cloth wrought or painted with various figures in red or black representing men's heads the sun and moon fish and animals which are frequently executed with much skill they also have a girdle of the same kind for securing the mantle or cut sack around them which is in general still more highly ornamented and serves them to wear their daggers and knives in in winter however they sometimes make use of an additional garment which is a kind of hood with a hole in it for the purpose of admitting the head and falls over the breast and back as low as the shoulders this is bordered both top and bottom with fur and is never worn except when they go out the garments of the women vary not essentially from those of the men the mantle having holes in it for the purpose of admitting the arms and being tied close under the chin instead of over the shoulder the chiefs have also mantles of the sea otter skin but these are only put on upon extraordinary occasions and one that is made from the skin of a certain large animal which is brought from the south by the Wiccaninish and Klaitsarts. This they prepare by dressing it in warm water, scraping off the hair and what flesh adheres to it carefully with sharp mussel shells, and spreading it out in the sun to dry on a wooden frame, so as to preserve the shape. When dressed in this manner, it becomes perfectly white and as pliable as the best deer's leather and almost as thick again they then paint it in different figures with such paints as they usually employ in decorating their persons these figures mostly represent human heads canoes employed in catching whales etc this skin is called metamelf 
and is probably got from an animal of the moose kind it is highly prized by these people is their great war dress and only worn when they wish to make the best possible display of themselves strips or bands of it painted as above are also sometimes used by them for girdles or the bordering of their cloaks and also for bracelets and ankle ornaments by some of the inferior class on their heads when they go out upon any excursion particularly whaling or fishing they wear a kind of cap or bonnet in form not unlike a large sugar loaf with the top cut off this is made of the same materials with their cloth but is in general of a closer texture and by way of tassel has a long strip of the skin of the metamelph attached to it covered with rows of small white shells or beads those worn by the common people are painted entirely red the chiefs having theirs of different colors the one worn by the king and which serves to designate him from all the others is longer and broader at the bottom the top instead of being flat having upon it an ornament in the figure of a small urn it is also of a much finer texture than the others and plated or wrought in black and white stripes with the representation in front of a canoe in pursuit of a whale with the harpooner standing in the prow prepared to strike this bonnet is called siya pokes end of section six